Okay, so welcome everybody to the first lecture of this course. My name is Camillo Delellis. I'm not Emanuele Spadaro. So our course is um, organized in 12 hours, six lectures. I will actually give the lectures of the first week, and Emanuele Spadaro will give the lectures of the second week. Okay? So the purpose of the course is to give you an introduction to a uh, fairly well-established area of geometric measure theory, which is called uh, uh, the theory of um, area minimizing currents. So let us start with the uh, basic problem that we have. So it's a very famous problem, which was formulated by the Belgian physicist uh, Plateau. So Plateau's problem is the following. Say that you have some k-dimensional surface gamma in some Euclidean space, but you can also imagine to have a Riemannian manifold over here. So this is a k-dimensional surface without boundary. Okay, so then we look for k plus one dimensional surfaces, sigma, such that the boundary of sigma is actually gamma, and sigma minimizes the k plus one dimensional volume. Okay, so of course you, you just imagine, for instance, you have a curve in R3, and you have a surface which is bounding this curve. You cannot achieve something which has as small area as you want. There's going to be something which is minimal, which has minimal area. So it's a classical problem in the calculus of variations. And actually, for Plateau, this problem was interesting uh, uh, when the dimension was 3 and k was equal to 1. So if you're actually trying to solve the problem for surfaces in R3, having a certain given boundary which is one dimensional. And in this case, you actually get a very nice physical model for it, which would be uh, uh, um, um, soap films, which was his original motivation. OK, so this is, of course, a very famous mathematical problem. And um, so what is going to be for us a solution, or what actually we are going to be interested in? So a, an existence theory. and also a regularity theory. And, and that's going to be what is most important for us. Well, so why do I stress actually on existence theory? Because one, first that you should, one thing that you f should first agree upon is what kind of area, I mean, what kind of surfaces do we allow? So can they have corners? Can they, have, can they be non-smooth? Well, so this actually, opens a lot of questions, opens a Pandora box of questions. So the way actually you should approach the existence theory is not uh, uniquely defined. So what we are going to see is one possible answer for the existence theory, and that is called the theory of integral currents. But there are also other possibilities. Now we will see that actually the theory of integral currents has a lot of appeal because it has a lot of geometric content. Um, but for instance, if you were interested in the original problem of Plateau, the theory of integral currents have some disadvantages. Okay? So, and then for the specific physical problem, you might actually want some other existence theories which maybe allow some type of singularities that the theory of integral currents do not allow. Okay? So, but we are not going to give you a panorama on how you actually uh, uh, define uh, other existence theories. We are going to actually focus on this. And although I would be most interested in the regularity theory, at the beginning I will have to give you at least the basics of what is the theory of integral currents. So let me give you very quickly uh, the main achievements of this theory and maybe a little bit of history also. So integral currents were defined first by Federer and Fleming. So 
also defined by Federer and Fleming in the 60s. And actually, in general, but there was a pre, uh, 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 there, there, there were some early works by De Giorgi in the co-dimension one case. Okay, so let me give you uh, uh, immediately the definition of what an integral current is. So, first of all, what is a current? So, a current is, I mean, a Feather and Fleming current, current, because we will see a more general version of this. So, a current is a linear functional. on the space of smooth, compactly supported differential forms. Actually, a current as a surface comes with a dimension. So let's say a k-dimensional current is a, is a linear function on the space of smooth, compactly supported differential k forms. Hmm? So the basic idea is that if you give me a smooth surface, over this surface I can actually integrate k dimensional forms. And I can look at the action of this integration on the space of k dimensional forms. So if, say, sigma is a smooth surface, I can think of it as a map from the space of k-dimensional forms, which we are going to denote in this way. So these are the smooth, compactly supported K forms. And here I just integrate over my surface sigma, the form omega, which gives me a number. OK? And of course, you see by the definition of integrating over a surface that if I vary omega in a smooth way, this is actually varying continuously, right? If I take a nearby form and I integrate something, a form which is nearby, then I get a nearby number. Okay, so, and this map has some continuity properties. Which is what actually is required on the definition, on the general definition of a current. Okay? Of course, you see immediately that that allows you to do a lot of things. I mean, if you are in such a general situation, you can, for instance, take, OK, so a notation for this will be later on this one. So we use this funny parenthesis just to identify the current. So this funny parenthesis computed on the, on the, partition, on the particular differential form is actually giving me this number. Of course, you see immediately that if I have such a huge degree of freedom, I can take, for instance, uh, uh, the following linear functional. I decide for a real number lambda in front of it. And this is also a linear functional on the space of k-dimensional forms. Okay. Okay, with such general definition, of course, the first thing that you would like to understand is what is the concept of boundary? And for you, the concept of boundary is, in, is in implied by the Stokes theorem. So you know by the Stokes theorem that if sigma has a smooth boundary gamma, then the integral of a closed, uh, of an exact form, uh, 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 I mean, you can integrate an exact form by parts.
So since Stokes' theorem tells you this, actually, in general, what you're going to take as definition of the boundary of a current is this action on forms. So if T is a current, which means I know what actually is the action of this current on k-dimensional form, then the boundary of T is the current, which is defined in the following way. So the, 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 the boundary of T is the k-1 dimensional current given by the following formula. The integral, I mean, the action of the current on some form omega is defined to be as the action of T on the exterior differential of the form omega. OK, so this gives you already a very good starting point. So now if you have a general, say, if you give me, for instance, a curve in R3, right, I can define the current which is associated to this curve. And then I can consider all the currents which have that current as a boundary. Now, to formulate a plateau problem, though, I have to tell you which is the, what, what is the generalization of the k-dimensional volume for this object, OK? So for this, we need the notion of mass and co-mass. So Consider a K form, then the co mass of omega at a point X is given by the following thing. So it's first of all a number, and this is simply the supremum over all E1 EK vectors such that um, the modulus of, OK, so let me define it in the following way, such that the determinant of EI dot EJ is less or equal than 1 of omega x evaluated on E1, EK, OK? So remember, a K form is just an alternating, I mean, for each point X, a K form is an alternating uh, uh, linear form in each of the entries, OK? And I'm taking the supremum over all possible choice of K-tuple vectors such that the determinant of this matrix, the modulus of the determinant of this matrix is less or equal than 1, OK? So actually, this you can, you, can, you can check. So this co-mass is really a norm on the space of alternating uh, 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 linear k forms. Maybe I, put, I should put a C over here. And now check the following interesting property. So if you want, this is an exercise. If sigma is a smooth surface, then the k-dimensional volume of sigma is actually equal to the supremum 
over all forms omega such that the Comas norm is pointwise less or equal than one. of the integral over sigma of omega, OK? So that's, for instance, very easy in one dimension. Right, so if you actually take a curve in one dimension, just check the following computation when you're actually looking at the action of a curve gamma on a surface on, on, on a one form omega, it's very easy to see this is actually equal if the curve is embedded to the integral over gamma of omega computed on the tangent vector. OK, and now you see that the thing is defined in such a way that the mass of omega is always less or equal. I mean, the co-mass of omega is always less or equal than 1 uh, in modulus. So the thing that you're integrating over here, right, is always less or equal than 1. If you want to maximize this thing, actually what you want to do is to choose omega in such a way that this omega of tau is exactly equal to 1. OK, and that's where you actually achieve your maximum, and the maximum is going to be the length of the curve. Of course, the thing is more complicated when you have more dimensions. And then you have to work with the k-linearity and so on, determinants and area formula and so on. OK, so this gives you the definition of the mass of a quadrant. So now, once again, is the pattern that I had before. So I use this observation to just say, OK, so since I have this nice identity on smooth surfaces, in general, for quadrants, which are sort of abstract object, I actually take this nice identity as a definition of mass. So the mass of a current T is given by, so the mass of T is simply the supremum now over all forms which have commas less than 1 of the action of the current on this form omega. OK, so this is actually called the mass of a current. And there is a space of currents, which is called the space of currents of finite mass. So in the new definition, a current has finite mass if, well, the mass of t is less than infinity. OK? So now you notice actually something very interesting. So the, 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 the mass is something, I mean, the space of currents is a linear space, meaning that since you're talking of linear functionals, you can take not only multiples of the currents with real numbers, but you can take really linear combinations. And this mass is defined for a given point? No, 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 no. So this constraint is true for every point, right? Every point. This is true for every point, but this gives you a number, OK? So it's, I mean, in the case of, I mean, in this case, it's like you're integrating over the, the whole surface, right? So the constraint is the constraint for every point, but you're integrating over the whole surface in here. I mean, that's the over, I mean, that's the underlying idea. Of course, this is not necessarily defined as an integration over something, okay? So you can then check somehow another thing, which is also very easy functional analysis. So the space of currents with finite mass is a Banach space. And this number, which is the mass of the current, gives you a norm. Well, OK, so it's a Banach space with this norm. OK, now let us go back to our original problem, right? So we have a 
general notion of boundary, which I have a general notion of mass. So now, given a certain, um, given a certain boundary, you can ask what is the current which has least mass, which is spanning this boundary. So. So given, say, a current S of dimension K in Rn, look for K plus one dimensional currents. T such that the boundary of T is equal to S and mass of t is the least possible. And it's not difficult to see that this is a problem which has existence out of simple functional analysis tools, okay? So somehow it's an exercise in functional analysis to actually see that there is always a solution. Well, okay. So if the mass of the current is equal, I mean, if, if, if there is no mass with, I mean, no current with finite mass that has this property, then anything is a solution. The mass is always plus infinity. But if there is at least one current which has finite mass and which is spanning your boundary, then this solution, I mean, this problem is always a solution and is a simple exercise in functional analysis. Meaning, you see that your norm over here is defined by duality against something, okay? So, your Banach space has some weak compactness properties, okay? So exercise this mass minimizing current always exists. Now, we are not going into the details, but there is one drawback of this general definition. And the drawback of this general definition is what we saw at the beginning. I give you a current, and you can do this nasty thing. I give you a nice surface. But you can multiply this nice surface by a real number. And that's, your, that's going to be your general surface. So I give you a curve, and you might decide to take E times this curve, or square root of 2 times this curve which is a bit disturbing. So you might get actually in this way solutions which are not so nice. I'm not going to give you any detail about this, but it's a known phenomenon in higher co-dimension that for instance, if I give you a curve in R4 and you apply this algorithm, you might get a funny solution as your area minimizing current. You, get, you can get for instance half of a nice surface a solution. This might happen. So the first examples, I think, go back to Fleming. So this might give you bad solutions. So this simple approach might give you bad solutions. For instance, half of a surface. And there is a, I mean, there is also somehow, of course, getting some, something which is singular is maybe sometimes something that you would regard as bad. But this getting half of a surface is really very bad because it will give you some kind of gap phenomenon, meaning the following. So, if you sort of look at your classical plateau problem, I mean, meaning I give you a smooth boundary, and you look at the infimum of the area among all smooth surfaces that have this boundary, it might actually happen that this infimum is a certain number, say 10, and it might happen that the minimum of this generalized plateau problem is five. So that there's really like a gap between the minimizer over here and what an infimizing sequence in a classical sense might achieve, okay? 
So this is called a Lavrentiev phenomenon. Maybe let me give you a silly example of Lavrentiev phenomenon. Okay? So I decide one surface, which I like a lot, which is my surface, Camillo's surface, and I define the area of the surface to be zero. I just define it to be zero. It's silly, but I define it. Then there's always a minimizer, and it's my surface, which is not what you would like to pick up. Okay? So of course, uh, and, and, and there is a gap, say. The minimizer you get by, by looking at in, in a sort of normal definition is one, and what I get is actually zero, and I get it in a silly way. Of course, this is much more interesting because you don't get it in a silly way. You get it in a way which looks very natural. Nonetheless, this is what happens. Okay, so the reason, I mean, the, this, this, this kind of uh, phenomenon is the reason why you actually introduce something more complicated, which are called integral currents, or integral rectifiable currents. So therefore, we want actually to restrict our class of, of admissible ob objects a little bit more. I will give you later on maybe a more formal, precise definition. So let me give you a first definition. So an integer rectifiable current is a current T of finite mass for which there exists three sequence of objects So these objects are going to be a sequence of small, um, of C1 surfaces, embedded surfaces in Rn. Closed subsets inside. And, well, they have to be oriented, actually. And integers with the following two properties. Well, first of all, This series is finite. And second, the action of the current on any form omega you recover from this converging series. So the upshot is I allow you to take any C1 surface. I allow you actually to take any closed subset of this C1 surface. And I'm integrating, of course, over this in the sense of Lebesgue, for instance. And then I allow you to take linear combinations of these objects. But these linear combinations have to be integer combinations, not real combinations. And then I allow you also to take an infinite series as long as I have this requirement over here, you see that this requirement over, over here will guarantee the convergence of this series.
Oh, EI, sorry, EI. Yes, EI, sorry, EI. Otherwise, the whole purpose of, integri of, 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 inter of, of introducing the EI is, is empty. Thanks a lot. Okay, so the current, for instance, might be, I mean, it might be that I give you a very nice surface, but allow you also to take scattered pieces over their surface, okay? So let's look at a practical example. So let's, let's give a practical example over here in one dimension. What I allow you to do, which you will like, obviously, because you will recognize it's a very natural thing to do. So for instance, I allow you to take two curves, gamma 1 and gamma 2, And then I allow you to take two pieces, so that's going to be one piece, and this piece, right? And now your current is just the union of these two pieces. OK, this is a current for you. And the action of the current on a form is I integrate over this line, I integrate over this line, and I take the sum of what happens. OK? But then I allow you also to take two copies of this and maybe three copies of that. Why not? But I don't allow you to take a square root of, square root of two or half a copy of this and one third of a copy of that. OK? So your coefficients have to be integers. Okay, so now, of course, you recognize that a classical smooth surface which bounds something when it exists is an integral rectifiable current in this sense. And now I would like to actually minimize the mass in this class. But now it's, it's not anymore an exercise in functional analysis. You see, before I had uh, the currents of finite mass, which was a Banach space, because I was allowed to take real combinations, I mean, linear combinations with real coefficients. But now I'm taking a nasty object because I'm telling you that you're allowed only to take integer coefficients, right? So now you're not anymore a Banach space, and the question whether the corresponding uh, formulation of the plateau problem is well defined or not is a very subtle question. And this was the achievement of Federer and Fleming. So let me give you this thing over here. So formulation of the plateau problem number two, which is the formulation we're going to take. Well, it's the generalized plateau's problem. OK, so consider now. A, an integer rectifiable current. Say gamma of dimension k. With the boundary of gamma equal to zero. And look for. K plus one dimensional integral car integral rectifiable currents such that their mass is minimal and they bound gamma. And now it's not any more an exercise. Well, if you're able to solve this exercise, you are Federer and Fleming. So <laughs> kudos to you. <laughs> it's a pretty difficult exercise, <laughs> especially because the proof at the time was very complicated. The proof now is still complicated, but kind of 
you know, much less complicated, but also because there's a lot of technology which has been introduced meanwhile. So the proof is less complicated, but you have to know much more stuff. So <laughs> it's still a pretty complicated thing. But let's say, so the, the Federer and Fleming theorem, theor theory has in some sense three cornerstones. So the first one is what is called usually compactness of integral currents. I will, I will state this compactness actually later on in the course in a more precise way. This compactness of integral currents gives you actually the existence of a solution for the plateau problem in this person. Then there is uh, a second cornerstone which is called deformation lemma. I'm not going to tell you exactly, actually, even in the course what the deformation lemma says. But what a, one of the effects of the deformation lemma is that there is no Lavrentiev gap phenomenon. So one effect of the deformation lemma is if there is a smooth surface, which in Rn is the minimum of your plateau problem in the classical sense, then that minimum is also in the solution of the plateau problem in this sense. OK? Whereas with the previous first formulation, you might have had a nice solution of the classical problem, but it was not a solution of your generalized problem. OK? So the deformation lemma gives you that any time you have, for some reasons, a smooth or reasonable solution in the classical sense of your plateau problem, this is also a solution in the generalized sense. OK, so actually, the def this, is, this is a consequence of the deformation lemma. Uh, uh, a true the statement of the deformation lemma would be a density statement. So the, the, the smooth surfaces is dense in an appropriate sense in the category of integral currents, although this is not, literally speaking, really true. I mean, you have to take a class of currents which is a little bit more complicated, which are called polyhedral chain, chains. But anyway, it's, I mean, the deformation lemma, if you want, is something like the density of smooth functions in a Sobolev space. So one good, actually, way of reading this theory is to draw the following analogy. The integral currents, or, or I mean, the, the theory of currents stays to function, I mean, the theory of currents stays to, distri um, to, to, to classical surfaces as general distributions stay to currents. The theory of integral currents stays to classical surfaces as Sobolev spaces stays to classical functions. And this deformation lemma stays, I mean, states the density of classical functions or of classical surfaces as you have density of classical functions in Sobolev spaces. OK? So that's more or less the idea. OK, so that is a third statement, which uh, uh, I'm going to tell you in the in the, uh, in, the, um, in, the um, in the in the future, it's also uh, the other cornerstone. It's called boundary rectifiability theorem. I don't know if I'm actually going to state it really, but well, let me tell you just that it exists. Okay. So maybe maybe later in the lecture I will give you a precise formulation of this boundary rectifiability. Okay, so, so far so good. Now you have an existence theory, which gives you something reasonable when the reasonable solution exists, but which might in principle give you a very, still a very rough solution of your plateau problem. So, I mean, you might have, you have smooth surfaces, that's fine. You have integral coefficients, that's fine. But you have, first of all, countably many of these surfaces, which might intersect in a strange way. And you have this nasty thing that you have closed subsets. Okay, so closed subsets of a surface might be extremely irregular. So 
you might have in principle uh, an integrative current which consists of pieces of C1 surfaces which are nice, but then the pieces might be very bad. They might be very fractal, irregular, closed subsets of your surface, okay? So, therefore, there is a very natural question. You ask how regular can actually this solution be, right? A similar, a similar thing, for instance, you encounter when, when you define harmonic functions as uh, a minimizer in W12 of the Dirichlet energy. A priori, a Sobolev function is very bad, but the minimizer is going to be an harmonic function with, which actually is analytic, real analytic inside, okay? So this is the question that we want to answer. What is the regularity of a solution in general? And in principle, there is a fantastic complete answer. Well, this is not even in principle. There is a fantastic complete answer, which gives you a very nice regularity theory, which is also optimal, okay? So, answers, co-dimension one. So the solutions in the Federer and Fleming f sense of the plateau problem are real analytic surfaces except for a singular set, which is closed and has Hausdorff dimension at most n minus 8. So, for instance, up to seven dimension, you take, I mean, in seven dimensions, you take a six-dimensional surface, you solve the plateau problem in this sense, the plateau problem gives you a real analytic surface. In eight dimensions, it might happen that the solution has a point singularity, okay? And the statement is optimal, meaning in eight dimensions, this, the following surface, which has a singularity at the origin, is area minimizing any time you intersect it with a sphere, for instance. So in R8, this surface is locally always area minimizing. Actually, the unique area minimizing current. Of course, this, this surface is infinite, so it doesn't have a boundary. What you do, for instance, you take a sphere of radius one, you cut this surface with a sphere of, of radius one, and you get a product of two S3, okay? And then you look for the solution of the, plat of the plateau problem, and the only solution you get in the sense of Federer and Fleming is this cone. And this cone has a singularity at the origin. Okay, so this is a very uh, uh, this is a very nice answer in in in, in co-dimension one. In co-dimension two, there is an equally nice answer. So now let k be less than n, less or equal than n minus two. Then any k-dimensional solution of the plateau problem
is a, a, a real analytic surface except for a closed set of dimension at most k minus 2. So this time you might encounter in singularity in a much, I mean, of, of, of a much larger dimension than before. So remember here you were considering hypersurfaces. So the dimension of the hypersurface is n minus 1. The singular set has dimension at most n minus 8. So in the surface, the co-dimension of the set is at most 7. In here, in the surface, the co-dimension of the set might be 2. And that's also an example which shows optimality. And the example is way much easier than before. You just take any holomorphic curve in C2, and you get it. So if, uh, uh, um, well, okay, so let us, let's, I mean, I will, I will give you more general examples anyway later. So let's take, say, ZW in C2, which you identify with R4, such that Z squared is equal to W cubed, okay? This gives you a solution of the plateau problem, the unique solution, actually, once you intersect it with a, a, a compact subset. So is locally as before, always the unique area minimizing integral rectifiable current. And obviously has a point singularity at 0. OK, so as you see, there is a dichotomy between codimension 1 and codimension 2. I will be able to explain why or what is the reason that there is behind this fact. I mean, why this is actually area minimizing and has a singularity. That's easy. Whereas it's way much more difficult to actually prove that this is area minimizing. Well, thanks to Guido, actually, now there is a very nice proof. But I mean, it was originally way much more difficult. This is a simple observation. Um, so it's much easier to give you counterexamples to regularity. But of course, as you might expect, it's much more difficult uh, 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 when you have easy counterexamples. It's then much more difficult to prove a regularity theorem than it is when you have less counterexamples. Okay? So this theorem is in codimension 2 is way much harder than the theorem in codimension 1. Okay? So the theorem in codimension 2, so the result in codimension 2, Uh, is due to Algren. And the proof is a book of 1,000 pages. Actually, his original manuscript, which was typewritten, so he, he did it with a typewriter because there was no tech, was 1,700 pages. But then tech allows you to put much more stuff in one single page, right, than a typewriter does. Um, and I've actually been uh, involved together with uh, Emanuele, who's giving the second part of, the, of, of, of this lecture. Uh, we've actually tried for quite a long time now to give a simpler proof of this, although we are still using basically the ideas of Algren. So we have just put everything on the web now. So we have. Uh, uh, essentially five papers, which all together give you a, a simpler proof of this. So five recent papers give you a simpler proof. And this is joint work with Emanuele. And somehow the idea of this course is to give you some 
bits on how this can actually be proved. Now, one has to say also the following. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about the codimension one case. In a sense, it's also because the codimension two case contains as subsets some of the main ingredients to have the regularity in codimension one. Okay? And also because it would be too long of a story. So the part of codimension one which is specific to codimension one would be a story for itself. Anyway, if you're interested in the codimension one, there are actually very nice references. So for codimension one, uh, you can look at the book of Justi. But there's also a more recent book by Maggi. So the classical references on the theory of currents, I mean, the most classical reference is Federer, which is a thick book, which not everybody considers as a nice bedtime reading. So that is Federer, and this is somehow, in some sense, the foundational book. So the, the title is Geometric Measure Theory. Um, much better, and this is what I actually learned when I was a student, is a book by Leon Simon. And this is called Lectures on GMT. It actually contains more than the theory of currents, but of course, it contains actually less than Federer when you go to the details. But recently, uh, uh, well, there's also a part of the book by Jacquinta, Modica, and Sushek. But recently, on this theory, and you would see something of it in the, in the other courses as well. I don't remember where the sign on, on the C goes. I think it goes like here. But due to recent uh, uh, developments, which we'll see also in these lectures, there's actually quite a nice reference by Kranz and Parks. Okay. On the regularity theory, of course, as I, as I told you, there is in codimension two, uh, uh, I, mean, all, all these, I mean, all these books, they contain uh, uh, something, I mean, most of the, of the things about the, the, the codimension one regularity theory. Uh, um, I think Leon, Leon's book actually and Federer's book, they are surely complete. I'm not sure about these two. Uh, uh, Justi and Maggi, they are all of, also complete. Of course, about the regularity theory in higher co-dimension, as you might imagine, since these five papers, they are very, very recent. There is no book and no nice reference. Okay? So the attempt of this course will, will be to give you some feeling for, 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 for this regularity theory. Uh, uh, and, of course, you can take the, the papers of um, uh, Emanuele and myself as a further reading if you want to go deeper in the theory. So, essentially, in this course now, in, in, in the first, uh, in the next five lectures, I will give you a little overview of a more general approach to the theory of currents, which is given by Ambrosio and Kirchheim. This approach is not only more general, but it's also slightly simpler. I mean, much, more, much simpler, actually, than uh, the original approach on Federer and Fleming is. So the goals for the next five lectures or hours is so uh, um, go through or give you the basics. of the approach of Ambrosio and Kirchheim to currents, which will be useful also for the lecture of Stefan Wenger next week. Actually, I will not be able to give you too detailed proofs of anything. But at least I want to give you an idea on how nowadays the compactness theorem is proved. This compactness theorem will also give you a nice motivation for some tools which is used later in the regularity theory. Huh? 
So some ideas on what is called slicing theory for currents and compactness. Okay, then I will give you an idea on how the regularity theory might be approached and what is giving, giving you a first step. So a first introduction to what is called nowadays Allard's regularity theorem, which actually for area minimizing current is essentially an idea which goes back to the Georgi. Sorry? Yes, in fact, that's why we will, I mean, I will give you an idea. And the idea is essentially already going back to the George. If you want to look at the real uh, uh, Allard's re Allard regularity theorem, then you have to look for, a, for I mean, then you have to, uh, uh, to uh, deal with very false. That's absolutely correct. Although you don't have to do actually that much of a theory, so if you want a complete proof of Allard's regularity theorem, you can look up on my webpage. I have lecture notes from a course, which is essentially 20 pages and gives you, starting more or less from scratch, a complete proof of Allard. So further reading, you can either take the book of Leon Simon Uh, but I have also some lecture notes. Okay, then I will tell you hopefully what happens in, in higher co-dimensions. So why or what is the main obstacle? So what makes things difficult? And to answer to this problem, I will, I will give you some basic intuition of uh, why you need so-called multiple valued functions. So, um, introduction to Almgren's multiple valued functions. Okay, and then from here on, next week, Emanuele should take over and give you some idea about how the proof goes on in higher co-dimension. Okay, so, I mean, in principle, I have still another hour of lecture, but maybe it's a good idea to make a five minutes break, right? Because it's like one hour and five minutes that I'm already talking. At least I am tired, so I guess you must be also. So let's say we make a five minutes break and then I start over again. Okay, so um, in this lecture, we are now introducing the Ambrosio Kirchheim uh, um, theory of metric currents, which goes back to, to, uh, to 2000. So this is a paper which is entitled Currents in Metric Spaces. Okay, so first of all, you will see that instead of defining things in duality with smooth K forms, which don't exist in general, on a metric space, we're actually going to build our theory in duality with Lipschitz functions. So the first definition we'd give is in some sense, uh, um, a substitute for differential forms. So then in our case, so from now on, maybe I should say over here, so, 
um, in this hour. E is a metric space with a distance d. Okay, so when k is bigger or equal than one, the set of which we will denote in this way, it's, it's in some sense the set of differential forms. So this denotes the k plus one tuples omega. F pi one pi k of real valued Lipschitz functions where F is also assumed to be bounded. We don't, we don't assume anything on the support, though. OK? So in the future, maybe we will use the following notation for omega. Okay, so what we are thinking on the back of our mind is that this replaces uh, 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 the usual differential form in Rn, which would be simply f d pi 1 wedge wedge d pi k. Okay, so although in, in, in um, in the Euclidean space, we are actually used to, uh, to consider these pi 1, pi k, and f as smooth functions. In this very general situation, we don't know what a smooth function on the metric space E might be. And even if we know it, in general, this gives you uh, a much more rigid situation than in Rn. Okay? So it's, of course, even maybe possible to introduce a notion of, um, of uh, more regular functions than Lipschitz functions for general metric spaces, but then this gives you very few test forms, so to say. OK, so the second definition uh, gives you metric functionals. So OK, so a k-dimensional metric functional is any uh, um, linear functional or is any uh, uh, map t well, it's, it cannot be linear because this is not a linear space sorry But it has actually the property that T is subadditive meaning that T of, for instance, F plus G pi 1 pi K is less or equal than T of F pi 1 pi K. 
plus of g by 1 by k. So that's subadditivity with respect to the first entry. And actually, it has to be subadditive and one homogeneous. And now, one homogeneity is what you would imagine when you're multiplying by a lambda. So with respect to all entries. So here I've written actually the subadditivity and the one homogeneity with respect to the first entry. But in fact, for the metric functionals, we actually ask that the same property is true for every of, 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 of the entries over here. So if I have t of f, and then here I have pi plus something, then I will, I will, I will have it less or equal than the modulus of t of f then the pi, and here is the t of f, and then the something else, OK? OK. Very good. So now for dk of a, I can define the operation of pushing forward. So if I have a function phi, which is going from symmetric space E into symmetric space F, and it's Lipschitz, and then I have Omega, which is f by 1 by k and belongs to dk of e. The push forward of omega is actually defined as composing all the functions in the pit of pole with phi. And this, of course, is going to be an element of dk of f. So that's the push forward. And then I can define an exterior differentiation. The exterior differentiation for any element omega in dk of e. Yes? Uh, he, um, oh, yes, 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 sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. So, of course, it is, uh, uh, yes. So this is not the pushing, this is not the push forward, sorry, this is the pullback of the form. Actually, that gives you a, 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 pull, a push forward on the metric functional, sorry. So that's actually the pullback. You are perfectly correct. And the pullback is going, of course, in the other direction. So I start from something which is defined on f, and I get something which is defined on e. Thanks a lot. OK, then when, when we define the same object on the currents, we will have actually a push forward instead of a pullback. We will see it in a moment. OK, so maybe let us say it immediately. So this defines push forward on metric functionals. Right, so and 
actually, right, so, um, mm -hmm. so the pullback actually has the DSs, the sharp above, in fact, according to standard notation. Yes. So the push forward zoometric function was then defined in the correct, uh, 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 in the other direction. So if t is a metric functional on dk of e, then the push forward of t is defined as a metric functional on dk of f. And of course, the push forward of t is acting on omega by simply taking t and act it and, and make it act, act on the pullback of omega. Okay, so that's it. that is the first natural operation, which of course corresponds exactly to the operation of pullback and push forwards for usual forms. The second operation is given by exterior differentiation. And that gives you a boundary operator for metric functionals. So the exterior differentiation goes from omega in dk of e. So this is now a p tuple, a k plus one tuple pi one pi k, and d omega is going to be equal to one f pi one by k, and that's actually an element in dk plus 1 of e. Okay, so of course what we have in mind as usual is that, so if omega in Rn is this object, well then the omega is nothing but the f wedge d pi 1 wedge d pi k. Okay, so this would be for standard smooth forms in Rn. And then you read off that our definition is consistent because here you can just think that you have k plus two, two tuples with one in front. So here there would be the coefficient one in front. Okay, and as before, by duality, once we have a notion of exterior differentiation on our dKe, then we have a notion of boundary on the metric functionals. So by duality, for us, the boundary of t acting on omega is just simply equal to t acting on d omega. Very good. Right, because the second entry is constant. So now, of course, uh, 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 as an object, somehow it doesn't vanish. But now you will see that we require certain continuity. Okay, so as you see, I'm not talking about alternating yet, okay? So the whole point, actually, that you will see somehow in a second is that there is no need of introducing alternating at the level of forms. Once you actually give the definition of alternation at the level of, uh, of currents, you will just have actually that currents is then giving you the number zero when you are computing on, on dt. So by the definition I've given you, dd omega actually is not equal to zero because you've not introduced alternation in there. 
but you will actually discover that when I introduce currents, I will have that two times the boundary of T is equal to zero, okay? The fact is that I've not yet told you what a current is. I've just told you what a metric functional is, right? So there are some axioms which are coming in a second. Okay, so uh, let me give you then another definition. So a third operation that you can actually do is taking essentially uh, wedge products if you want. which then gives you a restriction operator on currents. Well, let me just give you the operator, the restriction of operator on currents. So if T, uh, well, on metric functionals first, okay, so if T is a metric functional on D K of E and omega is in D J of E, okay, then T restricted to omega is a metric functional on dk minus j of E defined by So T restricted on omega computed on nu, it's actually equal to T computed on F G phi one phi J and then let's say rho one rho K minus J and that's if omega is F D pi and nu is G zero. Okay, so that's the restriction. And then we can introduce the mass of a metric functional. metric functional T has finite mass if there exists a measure mu on your metric space E. Such that any time that you compute T on F pi one pi K, you actually get that this is less or equal than the product of the Lipschitz constants of the respective Uh, pi i's times the integral over e of the modulus of f. Okay, so mu actually has to be a finite measure. Okay, so this defines 
uh, uh, what, has, what, is, what is somehow a finite mass, of course, you can imagine that then you can define the mass. So the mass is just going to be the following. So the mass of T So this time the mass is not going to be a number as we as we said before. So uh, 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 maybe let us put just quotation marks over here. So because the the, not the notation is a little the, the, the denomination is a little inconsistent with what we said before. So this time actually the mass is not going to be uh, uh, a number, but it's going to be a measure. So the mass of T is the minimal measure. for which this identity here, this inequality here holds. Actually, it's not so clear that such an object exists. Huh? In fact, this is slightly more subtle. I mean, it's an interesting, uh, 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 if you want, it's a fairly interesting exercise to show that actually such a measure exists. OK, so from now on, let's say this measure is denoted by this symbol. So this is characterized by the following two properties. First of all, the inequality E holds if you substitute this measure to mu. And then second, if E holds for some mu, then in the sense of measure, this mu is larger than the mass of t. Okay? So that's the sense in which somehow this measure mu is the minimal mass which is satisfying that. Okay, observe somehow that both The operation of uh, uh, push forward and restriction behave in a natural way with respect to the mass. So first of all, if I take the mass, the mass of the push forward of some metric functional t, then I have the following inequality. And if I take the restriction, then I have this other inequality. So these are both very simple exercises.
Okay, another important point is that so when a current has finite mass, so you can define the action of your metric functional. even when the first coefficient f is simply a Borel bounded function. Okay, and the reason is the following. So, of course, what you can do in that case, just take a sequence. Uh, sorry, a metric function. Yep. Okay, so then you can define actually the action even when f is a Borel bounded function. And in this case, actually, it's, 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 I mean, it's a straightforward exercise. I mean, there exists a sequence fi of uh, Lipschitz functions, which, are, which is converging to f, say, mu almost everywhere and also with soup of modulus of Fe, which is less or equal than soup of F. Okay, then you can show easily that there exists the limit of the action on this t over fi pi 1 pi k. Hmm? I mean, it's important that actually the fi, I mean, the f is Borel, but the pi 1 pi k remain Lipschitz. Okay, so there exists this limit as i goes to infinity, and it is independent of the approximation. You can check it as a simple exercise in measure theory. Good. So maybe another thing which is worth remarking, and this is also an interesting exercise, is an, an interesting exercise. So when you actually want to compute the mass of an open set, So the mass of E is actually the least constant such that the following inequality holds.
Okay, and consistent with actually the notation that we had in the previous lecture, for us, now what we before called the mass of t, which was actually a number, is just the total value that this measure has on e. Okay, so, so far so good. I mean, we have not yet actually introduced what a current is. Maybe one last thing that I have to tell you, which might be useful in the future, is that another interesting definition is for a metric functional of finite mass is the support. So the support of T is nothing but what is usually the support of the measure mu, right? The support of the, support of the measure mu is just the sets of all, I mean, the closed set of all points X in E uh, such that, oh, sorry, support of this measure such that the measure computed on the ball is positive for every radius you choose for your ball centered at x. Okay, so as it was actually already asked before, so um, where is the multilinearity structure that you usually see in forms? What is the transition for everything in the narrow of the ball to the magnitude of e? Sorry? So this, of course, has to hold for every f and every pi. Oh, that is, has to be positive, sorry, yes. So here the condition, of course, is, I mean, the points in the support are the points such that any time you center a ball on the point, you actually have that the measure is positive, okay? So the usual support of a measure as you would define it uh, classically. So we are now ready, finally, to give you a definition of the currents. So now a metric functional T is a current if so T has finite mass. T is multilinear. T is continuous with respect to the pi entries in the following sense. So when I compute, well, it's continuous on the first entry that we sort of saw from the fact that there is this finite mass condition, but we didn't have, we didn't give any continuity on the other entries, and the continuities are given through this axiom. So if I have a sequence, I mean, if I have sequences pi i1, pi i k converging to pi1, pi k, then the action of the current passes to the limit. And for this, I have to tell you what is the notion of convergence when the pi i j converge to pi j pointwise and there is a uniform bound on the Lipschitz constant. OK? 
Okay. So then the fourth axiom is actually that T of F pi 1 pi k is equal to 0 if for some i in 1 k the function pi i is constant on a neighborhood of the points where f are different than zero. Okay? So and now you actually come, we actually come to, so who asked the question? Uh, I think over there somebody. Yes, you asked the question. So you see in here, somehow we are thinking about, I mean, if we, if we go back to the definition of Federer and Fleming, this would be somehow acting on a differential form, right? So if this f pi 1 pi k would correspond to a differential form on Rn, right? So if omega equal f, d pi 1 wedge, which d pi k is a differential form, is, is a true differential form in the classical sense, then this assumption over here just tells you the d pi i vanishes where f does not vanish, which actually means that that would be equal to 0. And so this condition here is consistent with what we know usually for currents. Of course, what we also know for currents is that they would be uh, uh, alternating on the various other entries. But uh, that's one of the interesting things of the theory. You don't have actually to assume this alternating condition. It actually is given to you by the other four axioms. So maybe let me give you yet another definition. Uh, although maybe first I would have to do a remark. So T is a normal current if both T and the boundary of T are currents. Okay, so now this is going to be one of the cornerstones of the Ambrosio Kirchheim theorem theory. So
the extension of a current T to Borel entries or to Borel functions in the first entry satisfies the following properties. So first of all, you have the product and chain rules. So this tells you, first of all, T is multilinear in all entries. And, as you would expect, first of all, if you compute T of F T pi 1 wedge, wedge T pi K plus T pi 1 T F wedge, wedge T pi K, this is equal to T of 1 D of F pi 1 wedge, wedge D pi K. Okay, so this is the product rule. You then actually have the chain rule. So the chain rule is actually telling you if you, if you compute T of F and then you compose classical functions with some pi. So here pi is a function from E into RK, which is Lipschitz. And then psi is a function from RK to RK, which is Lipschitz. That actually this over here is equal to T times F. Here you would have the determinant of D psi. And then D pi 1 wedge, wedge D pi K. Okay, so it's important actually to know that since you are dealing with Lipschitz functions, psi is differentiable almost everywhere. Actually, its differential is also a Borel map. So here you have to compose with pi, which I forgot. So pi is a Lipschitz map. D psi is actually a Borel map. So this determinant of D psi is also a Borel map. And so this object is well defined. OK, and then. Finally, we have also the locality property. Uh, no, first we have the continuity, sorry. So if fi minus f is converging to zero strongly, in the L1 space given by the mass of the current, and pi 
i j is converging to pi i uh, to pi j pointwise with a uniform bound on the Lipschitz constants. then you can pass into the limit on the actions of currents. And then finally you have the locality property. So the locality property is actually telling you that T of F pi 1 pi k. Okay, so T of F pi 1 pi k is actually equal to 0 if F different from 0, so the set where F does not vanish, is contained in the union of some sets in Bi where pi i vanishes on Bi. Okay, so this actually uh, uh, um, is a consequence of the axioms. We are not going to prove this theorem, although the proof that you find uh, in the paper is not that complicated. You will maybe notice one interesting fact. This chain rule over here, this chain rule over here gives you the multilinearity. So the four, as I, the four, as I told you, a consequence of the axioms of continuity, locality, and so on is actually that you have the multilinearity as a, a, a bonus. So the reason why that actually implies the multilinearity, you see it immediately. So if you apply this uh, identity to a map psi which goes from rk to rk and just permutes the components of the vector, you will then discover that you just got uh, the alternating property. Huh? So, remark. apply the chain rule to maps psi which just rearrange the components of vectors in RK. then you get that T is alternating. Okay, so you may wonder why actually this happens. So uh, um, the reason why this happens is essentially because for the continuity, I mean for the continuity axioms that we have given and for the locality axioms, essentially the determinant is the only thing which makes this happen. Anyway, another question which is maybe interesting is, so how does this theory compare with the Federer and Fleming theory? It was actually shown by Ambrosio and Kirchheim that a normal current in their sense corresponds to normal currents in the sense of Federer and Fleming if you are on the Euclidean space.
And it's also easy to see that a current of finite mass in the sense of Federer and Fleming is a current in the sense of Ambrosio and Kirchner. But it was open whether a current in the sense of Ambrosio Kirchheim is always a current of finite mass in the sense of Federer and Fleming. So possibly the currents of finite mass in the sense of Ambrosio and Kirchheim are larger. But actually, I think in the third week, Marianna Xiornier will uh, talk about this. So it was known in some situations because it's uh, linked to some uh, deep result of price in real analysis, and I think she has been able to extend this in general uh, just in the last years. So, so this should actually be now so the equivalence follows in some special cases by work of price and Alberti Tournier price and I think in general by recent work of Jones and Sornier. OK, so that's all for today. I'm sorry for going quite a bit extra time, actually.